Welcome to Tech Talks. Our security edition today is focused on risk-based alerting at machine speed with Splunk Phantom. Tech Talks is a series of short webinars that are deep dives for technical practitioners. We value you, our customer, and want you to continue in your Splunk journey. Our experts help create these best practices, and we want you to leverage them in your daily role. I'm Olivia Courtney, a Security Product Marketing Specialist, and I'm excited to share some information with you about Splunk and introduce my colleague, Kelby Shelton. Hi, my name is Kelby Shelton. I'm a consulting sales engineer with Splunk, and I focus on the security portfolio of Splunk, and I'm here to talk about how we can respond to risk-based alerting events using Splunk Phantom. Thank you, Kelby. During this presentation today, we will talk about one of the largest problems security operations centers see today. We'll explain how Phantom and risk-based alerting work together to solve these problems, and we'll show you a demo of how these tools work together to get the job done. Then we will cover additional resources available to help you take advantage of Phantom and RBA capabilities in Splunk. Our team will be available for Q&A over the Q&A section within your screen. And if you watch a recorded version of this webinar, please continue the conversation through the Splunk Community website under the Tech Talk discussions for any follow-up questions. So let's get started. Today's Security Operations Center is under siege. The volume of security alerts is massive. In fact, according to a survey reported by SC Magazine, 27% of enterprise security teams see more than 1 million alerts per day. That number of alerts makes it nearly impossible for analysts to respond in a timely manner, and day after day, this results in a pileup of abandoned cases. Now I'd love to hand this over to Kelby to explain how Splunk solves these problems. Thank you, Olivia. So let's first talk about what risk-based alerting is. Now this presentation today is not going to be an in-depth dive of risk-based alerting, but let's just refresh ourselves on a couple of the concepts. So first, we score anomalies based on a user or system, an, an entity in our environment being attacked. Once we've done that, we align our detections to a security framework. These two pieces together allow us to stitch together a uh, evidence of compromise or um, even, even a one-off attack uh, and bubble up only the alerts that are most important to us, allowing every single alert to be triaged and investigated in a timely fashion. Now, a couple presentations I'd like to point out, if you'd like to learn more about risk-based alerting, is the SEC 1391C that you can see on your screen, Full Speed Ahead with Risk-Based Alerting. That was a presentation from .conf20. And we also have SEC 1803, Modernize and Mature Your SOC, a presentation from .conf 2019. So with all that being said, let's now dive into some adjustments and additions we will make to our risk-based alerting strategy to enable both the threat intelligence uh, gathering of all of the activity in our environment, as well as moving forward with Splunk Phantom and all the benefits of automation and orchestration. So the first thing we need to do is add a bit of information to our detections for risk-based alerting. These come in the form of threat objects. Now threat objects are all of those little residual indicators that surround that system or user or entity in your environment uh, that contain things like file hashes, IPs, domains, URLs, etc. Now these are really important to collect and normalize so we can later use them for graph analysis, machine learning, and ultimately what we're talking about here today, automation. It's not hard adding these threat objects to your existing detections. As you can see on your screen, we can do that with a simple eval statement. Here we are adding a file hash along with the threat object type equals file hash. And by doing those two additions, uh, we can get normalized threat data 
about what happened with this specific detection. Obviously, replace out those variables with IPs or file names or processes, anything ap applicable to that actual detection. Now, I'd like to point out that you should always strive for something specific enough that you can respond to it later. So, for example, if presented with a file name or a file hash, opt for using a file hash because we can do virus total lookups or um, other enrichment around a hash that just aren't available with a generic file name. Also, on the uh, bottom of your screen there, we have the ability to add multiple threat objects with the append pipe command uh, on instances where we have maybe processes and file hashes uh, in the same uh, alert, we can capture both sets of data. So by following a risk-based alerting strategy, adding in rich threat indicator data and labeling it all properly, we are left with a multifaceted, multi-phase detection that can be automated and orchestrated using Phantom. So with the preparation out of the way, we can now dive in to what this looks like in a uh, real world demonstration. And we're going to start with a uh, Splunk Enterprise Security Notable Alert, a risk-based detection that we're going to then send to Phantom and show how all these systems mesh together. So let's dive right into that demo. So here we are on our incident review screen, and we are investigating what notables we have, risk-based alerts that have bubbled up and been presented to us. A couple things to notice here is that we have 17 matching notables, take note of that number, and that we have uh, all of this sorted by risk score, and we can take a look at the highest priority one here. We see a risk object be stole, a attack tactic threshold has been met. And sure enough, as we're exploring the fields and the risk rules that were involved, we can see a multitude of detections leading to this very high risk score. At the bottom, we also notice the threat object types. We have a command, email, file path, a hash, IP and a process path. Now we're gonna drill in to see what those are and how they're related to our risk object. So if we click on this action menu and examine the risk attributions for B stole, we'll see the identity information for this user and we will also see the timeline of events. Quickly seeing that there's a lot of activity related to this user, as well as a lot of related threat objects. So again, to reiterate, what are threat objects? They are all of the little residual IOCs that are left behind when an attacker steps foot, if you will, on your network. These are things such as process paths, command lines, emails, IP addresses, domains. All of those things are interesting and need to be collected for the purpose of analysis and also generating reports about what types of threats you're seeing. In addition to that, we can use this normalization of IOCs to automate and orchestrate the investigation of all of these indicators. And we'll pivot over to Phantom to show how this is done. On this next tab here, I am on the Splunk Phantom home screen where I can see all of my case statuses and events that are being worked across uh, all of my shifts. 
I can then go to drill in further on the notables I received from Splunk Enterprise Security to take action on. Now, typically this screen here is where you're going to assign events to users, make notes, change statuses, or bundle events up into an investigation or a, a case in the uh, Phantom language. So you'll notice at the top of the screen, we have 13 notables. Well, previously I mentioned we had 17 notables from Splunk Enterprise Security. So what happened to some of our notables? Well, we'll take a look at that in a moment. First, I wanna drill down on the notables that are pending review. These are the notables that Phantom has already investigated and now are awaiting a human analyst to come in and verify that they can be closed or they need additional um, time spent investigating. So let's look at our first one, psurf-l. Phantom has pinned a few items to the HUD, letting me know how many tasks are remaining for this investigation, whether or not there are any threat indicators, and whether or not Phantom has decided to take action based on the, uh, the criteria that our automation engineers uh, decided to implement. So uh, we have a hash, and if we mouse over, we can see that hash has a score greater than 10. We can also see that the hash was automatically blocked using carbon black because it had a score greater than 10. If we then look at our workbook, we can see Phantom has documented its investigation along the way. Starting with prepare investigation, we see it took Phantom 0.1 minutes to collect and add all relevant artifacts. In this case, seven artifacts, seven detections that are related to psurf-l and all the attributes as well, collected the identity information, the asset information and posted it to this investigation. Next, Phantom proceeded to investigate all the indicators that it had an integration for, or that a playbook had been designed for. So uh, we have a playbook designed for investigating file hashes in this environment. And we proceeded to gather external intelligence about all the hashes we saw and post a report for the analyst to review. So we can see that the majority of these were zero, but one had a really high score. And if we follow that link over to virus total, we can see the very high detection and what all the other signature or all the other AV vendors are uh, listing this as. So it's, it's good that we've automatically taken action on it um, because it's not something we want on any of our endpoints. Finally, after Phantom got through all of the investigations, it went to containment. And as we saw earlier, it blocked the threats and indicators of compromise. Next, we can look at the quarantine device or disabled user by reviewing our available evidence in here, looking at the timeline and artifacts, we can decide to make a choice about whether or not we would want to uh, proceed with quarantining this device. But for now, we'll go ahead and mark this closed and proceed to our next investigation. Now, uh, this is a little bit higher score. Um, it's, it's higher because Phantom has seen that the uh, virus total has uh, marked this hash as malicious, but it hasn't taken any action um, because I told it not to for the purpose of this demo. Now let's take a look at our workbook. See that Phantom collected and added six artifacts. And as we switch over to the analyst screen, we can see that 
those artifacts are lined out here in sequential order. They start with the notable event and then they show the timeline that they uh, occurred in your environment. So if I sort it by ID, I can see that first a network discovery command was performed on this machine. Next, a system network configuration. Then an LNK file launched a process. Not usually a good sign. Finally, a uh, Trojan was detected, this Oneva malware family. Now, if I want more information, all I have to do, because Phantom has gone through, collected everything, posted it to my investigation, I can just click into any of those events and get more information, including the complete command line, the description of activity, file hash, file name, file path, everything I would want to know I've got it at my fingertips, as well as the threat object has been mapped to a file hash. So when I click on this file hash, I can see any related events. I have no related events for this hash, but Phantom will recommend actions based on the fact that this is a file hash. So reputation checks, et cetera. So now that I see that this hash is malicious, I can decide to take action. So I'm gonna launch a playbook I'm going to call this RBA containment. Uh, this is, there we go, RBA containment threat object. Let's go ahead and launch that. And Phantom will prompt the analyst, um, the CERT team or whatever team is responsible for uh, taking action. So in this case, it's prompted the administrator, myself, and it says, uh, please decide the threat objects you want to block. So we only have one with the, uh, the indicator greater than 10. So it's only given me one choice. Now, if there were IPs, domains, emails, a bunch of other things, Phantom would list them here based on what playbooks and response plans our organization has developed uh, in this demo environment. And we'll uh, get to that here in just a moment and show you kind of how the, the back end works. So file hash, want to block it, absolutely hit complete. Phantom is going to let me know that, yep, it did it. And if we look at our summary view, we can see the containment has occurred. We have the notes, file hash was blocked. Task marked complete. And again, I can decide to di disable this, this device or just close it and move on. All right, so let's finally, on this case management portion, talk about what happened to those remaining notables. So I'm going to look at the in-case events. So I have six events that are marked as status in case. Well, I can see I have actually four cases that have been opened on my behalf. And one of them has three events in it. Well, what happened here? Well, as a part of the analysis of this, for every event it ingested, it periodically would go through and check, do I have any related events, any artifacts that two or more events have in common? If so, those things should be bundled up priorities adjusted, and a case created. And here, Phantom has done that. So I have three related notable event IDs involving this machine, Titan. I can see that Phantom went ahead and disabled a user. Well, why did Phantom decide to go ahead and disable a user? Well, when I was setting up this, uh, this integration for response, I decided that if a user is unknown in my identity inventory uh, or has a low priority, it's generally safe to go ahead and disable that user if they're involved in a case. And so that is kind of the decision-making criteria you can develop with Phantom. 
and the, the playbooking, uh, the power of the, the playbooking language. So we can look at our workbook as always to see the activity, how long each event took. And one thing to call out here is the timeline. We can see that initially Phantom added a few artifacts and then later on it added some more because it saw a related event. And then 40 minutes passed by, it saw two more events show up that were related. It still did the investigation. It investigated IPs, domains, hashes, et cetera. Um, but it also bundled all of that information into this investigation. So if I look over my notes, I have lots of notes uh, about all the activity. I've got all my hash reports and I can review everything from a single case. So how does one begin to put this together from a playbooking perspective, from an automation perspective? Well, using the modularization that Phantom affords, we can very simply scale up our operations as more integrations are uh, onboarded, as well as more uh, response procedures are developed. So let's take a look at that now. Everything starts with this RBA controller playbook. Now this is just a simple uh, playbook that decides the order of operations. The first thing it does is it makes a decision. Have I investigated this event before? If not, go ahead and collect all the artifacts and prepare all that data gathering that an analyst would normally have to do and, and bundle it up in this investigation. Next, proceed to investigate all of those threat objects. Now, this is where you can really modularize and begin to scale up your operations. Let's go look at RBA investigation. Now, you'll see that we have three investigations, an IP, domain, and hash. We have a decision point at each playbook that says, do I have a threat object type of IP, domain, or hash? Now, this is why it's really important to label your threat objects and threat object types, because further down the line, you can plug and play response plans or playbooks and uh, investigate those. So let's take a look at one of these response plans, RBA investigate IP address. As we zoom in, we can see that Phantom added a workbook, started its tasks, documented its investigation, and then proceeded to perform the actions that we have connections set up for, for this demo environment. So, you know, if you can onboard threat intelligence sources or other premium applications, you can insert those here, but out of the box, you can get value from this, uh, this framework. So we're just doing some basic who is lookups, virus total IP reputation, and we're reaching back into Splunk to get some information about this IP's activity in our environment. So very simple, we plug it in, we've developed a response plan, an investigation plan for IP addresses, and then we plug it into our overall RBA framework here. So to reiterate, as you begin to develop new ones, for example, say I develop a RBA investigation for an email address and I wanna add it to run Anytime an email shows up, all I have to do is drag and drop, make a decision point and say, if I see a threat object type of email, go ahead and launch an email playbook. That simple. So you design your email playbook, and you plug it in right here and it just works for all of your RBA events moving forward. 
So this is how you combine risk-based learning, threat objects, and automation for really powerful, holistic security, detection, response, and case management. If we start at the beginning, we know that uh, we had 1,300 detections in this demo environment. Those 1,300 detections were scaled down to 17 notable events. Afterwards, those 17 notable events were sent to Phantom. They were investigated, they were aggregated, and turned into four cases awaiting analyst review. That is, talk about cutting through the noise. Uh, so this is the power of Phantom and RBA. Great, thank you so much, Kelby, for that presentation and demo. We're about ready to wrap up this Tech Talk, but before we do, I wanted to share quick resources available to you to continue your journey. You will receive these assets in a follow-up email as well as the recording. Our .com 20 sessions, Phantom and Focus, and Full Speed Ahead with Risk-Based Alerting give you an even more in-depth look at each of these products. You can find additional Phantom and RBA documentation at phantom.rbaallday.com and of course, if you're ready to try Phantom for yourself, you can use our free community edition. And finally, don't forget that we have an incredible community of Splunk users on our community site. You can search the answer section on risk-based alerting and Splunk Phantom. You can continue the conversation for this talk within the discussion section called Tech Talks. And finally, there's Splunk Ideas, where you can submit new product enhancements or vote for current ideas from other customers. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules to join us today. Please tune back in for future Tech Talks. We're excited to share this series with you.